Today we're going to introduce you to the Peel Pack for a transformational technology known as the Nanoscope. What makes the Nanoscope special is looking at the Nanoscope, you can see the scope. It's two millimeters. Standard arthroscopy for the upper extremity, specifically um, hand, wrist, and elbow, is much larger, at least double the size. There's a one millimeter sensor on the end of the scope that allows you to have unbelievable visualization. It really will be a transformational tool in allowing us to improve patient care. You have a blunt trocar and a sharp trocar to allow you to insert. You have two inflow cannulas and two stopcocks. What makes this set special is you can do dry arthroscopy, limited fluid arthroscopy, and if needed, in the OR, you can use a pump, you can use gravity. So there's a lot of things that you can do in a sterile peel pack. But what makes Nanoscope special is just with some initial tools, we have a punch, a grasper, scissors, and a nitinol probe. One of the other things when you're doing standard wrist arthroscopy is when you insert a standard metal probe, which is at least four millimeters, you get hooked up on the tissue as you're trying to insert it. But as you can see, a smooth cannula allows you to insert easily, and then you can deploy the nitinol probe, which is two millimeters. In this wrist arthroscopy, we're going to utilize the nanoscope. I've already outlined the wrist portals, and we've already atraumatically punctured the capsule with standard instruments. We're going to insert the nanoscope with a blunt trocar, um, and you can see the inflow cannula. Small instrumentation, huge advantage of the nanoscope. The inflow cannula has been introduced. We're pulling out the blunt trocar. We're going to introduce the two millimeter nanoscope. Around two millimeters in diameter, the insertion is easier than standard arthroscopy. As you can see down here, inferiorly and proximally, this is the radius articular cartilage, a fairly healthy specimen, as you can tell. Right above us, there's a little fibrillation, so you can see this is some grade, do, grade two chondromalacia of the scaphoid. I mean, you can see this so clearly in a, in a manner that you've never been able to see it with a standard 30-degree scope. You're looking directly at the fibrillated cartilage. As you insert it, um, you can see the synovium on the volar side of the wrist. One of the really awesome things about the nanoscope is it has a flexible, a flexible quality that standard wrist arthroscopy doesn't have. If you do that, you will break standard wrist arthroscopy. The, the nanoscope has an amazing amount of flexibility that allows you to adjust your hand and see things that you've never been able to see in a, in a direct vision, like an open procedure in an arthroscopic manner. Here is the uh, normal appearing scapholunate ligament and, and you're really looking at it in a, in a manner that you don't typically get to look at it right above me. You can see the scapholunate ligament, the normal concavity of the scapholunate ligament. And then as I drop into the area of the TFCC and the ulnocarpal joint, some of the initial feelings that I'm having with the arthroscopy is the maneuverability is unbelievable. One of the other things that I think of um, when I'm using this and visualizing the TFCC is one of the things that we struggle with sometimes in arthroscopy is that our tools get in the way of each other. One huge advantage of the nanoscope is the ability to do fine adjustments as you're working through the other working portals. In this cadaveric specimen, as you can see, the visualization is not optimum, but one of the advantages of the nanoscope is I can have my assistant inject just a little fluid to improve visualization. In an in vivo procedure, in a live procedure, the visualization would be pristine. I'll have my assistant inject some fluid to allow for improved visualization. What's amazing about the nanoscope is you can really titrate your fluid. And one of the things with arthroscopy in any joint is fluid management. And you have to be, you have to be precise in your fluid management to allow you to take care of the patient efficiently and safely. But one of the things that I'm seeing, and you can see this with this nanoscope, is, is this a tear? We're looking at it on FOSS. The ability to see a micro tear in the, in the central articular disc of the TFCC will unbelievably change your accuracy of diagnosis. Imagine using this nanoscope in the office or a procedural room. Sure, you want to get an MRI, but I think this can tell you, is it torn radially? Is it torn volarly? Is it torn ulnarly? Or is it torn dorsally? In this patient, if there's anything, there may be a central articular disc tear, which I have in the middle of the field. I have the ability with this ergonomic handle to take a picture with one button. I have the ability right below it. And this is so ergonomically sound when I'm using it uh, today. Um, I can take live video also. And as you can see, the video capture is on. 
at five seconds, six seconds, and I'm turning it off right now. One of the other things that we can do with the nanoscope is we can insert um, an inflow cannula for you. And as you're trying to evaluate the TFCC, we can insert the nitinol probe, which is two millimeters, and deploy the probe. And then you can see the ability to really test that TFCC fraying is unbelievable. Right now, I'm also testing the trampoline effect of the TFCC. And I think you can see that the, the trampoline effect is uh, intact. If you've done a lot of wrist arthroscopy, you know one of the things that really hinders your visualization in the ulnocarpal joint is this synovitis on the backside. So I'm looking at, uh, at that synovitis and trimming it out really easily and looking at it from a view that you usually don't see it because it's a zero degree scope. When you're using a standard wrist arthroscopy, obviously things are a little bigger. You can hit that shaver with a with a nanoscope, these are disposable scopes, disposable peel packs. Your need for maintenance and repair is, is going to be much less. As we're introducing the, the nanoscope into the radial carpal joint, you can see the volar synovium, and you can get a hint of the radioscaphocapitate complex, the long and short radiolunate ligaments under this synovium. Um, those are vital ligaments in carpal stability, and honestly, I don't think you can get that close to those ligaments with standard wrist arthroscopy, and you certainly aren't going to see it with, the, with this kind of detail. One of the things that you'll get used to with the, with the nanoscope, here inside that synovium is probably the ligament of testute, which is kind of a neurovascular structure which supplies the scaphalunate ligament. And right here, you can get an unbelievable view of the scaphalunate ligament. Also, as you're coming up the Right here, I'm looking at the volar portion, the membranous portion. We're getting to the proximal portion of the scaphalunate ligament. And up here, I'm getting into the, the dorsal side of the scaphalunate ligament. Those of us that do a lot of wrist arthroscopy know that, yeah, we're always trying to look at the dorsal side of the scaphalunate ligament. But I think that you can see the dorsal side of the scaphalunate ligament. And guess what will be here is a dorsal ganglion and the root of the dorsal ganglion. So I think the nanoscope will give us the ability to not only diagnose and treat these dorsal uh, carpal ganglions that, uh, you know, is a huge um, thing that we see a lot of in hand wrist surgery. And I would look at this scaphalunate ligament and you guys can, anyone would probably say that has a patchless appearance. And you know, there's no step off between the uh, scaphoid and lunate from the radial carpal side. Uh, but as with most wrist arthroscopy, the only way we're really going to be able to diagnose the amount of instability is from the midcarpal side. So you can already see some fraying of the articular cartilage here on the lunate, some synovium getting in the way, but I'm looking directly at the articular cartilage of the lunate. I mean, in a view, I, I, I am inside uh, the area, the junction between the scaphoid and lunate from the radial carpal, um, radial carpal portal. I don't think I've ever seen it in such detail. I can tell you with standard wrist arthroscopy because it's not flexible. It doesn't allow you to kind of come around the corner of the radial styloid like this. You can get around the corner of the radial styloid and the ability to, to do a partial radial styloidectomy you, it would, be, uh, would be a, a huge advantage I'm coming around the entire radial styloid, going around the periphery of the radial styloid in a way that we've not been able to do. And in slack wrist changes and snack wrist changes, um, uh, the ability to study this radial styloid and diagnose grade one slack problems and arthrosis uh, will be changed uh, by using nanoscope technology. For those of us that have done a lot of wrist arthroscopy, I can promise you that it is hard to get this far radial in the wrist. So I'm already noticing that the field of view and the ability to be precise in your diagnosis and treatment with nanoscope uh, will become a huge advantage in this technology that we're only really beginning to explore. And just the ability to now just maneuver around the wrist is unbelievable as I pull back, study the scaphalunate ligament, the volar extrinsic ligaments, the radial styloid with the frayed synovium, looking at the backside 
and there will be an uh, there will be a significantly decreased risk of chondral damage with this technology. I've entered the wrist through the radial midcarpal portal using the nanoscope, and right now I'm focused on the uh, scaphoid-lunate junction, and I'll pull back so that everyone can see that. Here's the scaphoid. Here's the lunate. I think we would all agree that this junction looks a little fibrillated. And so, you know, from the radial carpal side, we saw a patchless appearance of the scaphoid-lunate ligament. And we'll deploy the probe as I pull back here, and we can see the two millimeter nitinol probe that is in here. So, you know, Geisler's classification of scaphoid-lunate ligament instability uh, says that a in grade two instability, which we saw a patchless appearance, maybe with a little step off in the radial carpal joint, I can kind of get the probe in there. And most probes are three to four millimeters. So if I'm able to get a two millimeter probe in, uh, this is early grade one to two instability. Uh, but certainly, I mean, it is extremely difficult with standard arthroscopy to look around this volar corner of the scaphoid-lunate junction. I am on top of the articular cartilage distal aspect of the lunate, and right here, we can see we can see the uh, lunato triquetral junction, and as you can see, um, this cad cadaveric specimen has some synovitis on the dorsal side, and uh, maybe some fibrillation of the cartilage, maybe some grade two chondromalacia, and uh, that's either the dorsal ligament um, with a little fraying or some cartilage with some fraying. So. As I sweep over the lunato triquetral junction, I'm going to look up at the capitohamate ligament. And again, for those of us that do a lot of wrist arthroscopy, it is very difficult with standard wrist arthroscopy tools to go from the volar side of the capitohamate ligament to the more proximal and the dorsal side of, this, of the capitohamate ligament. Uh, I'm at the top side of the capitohamate junction. I'm getting ready to to probably creep into the fourth and fifth CMC joints um, where I'm at. But this is the capitohamate junction, and you can see there's some fibrillation of the cartilage both on the capitate and a little bit on the hamate. And with nanoarthroscopy tools, which are also two millimeters, we can get into, here, in, into this STT joint and, if necessary, debride it. I think it's extremely difficult to get to this joint with standard standard wrist arthroscopy tools.